Uh, Romans chapter 16, and in Romans chapter 16, uh, I want to look at a verse that we've already looked at it before, but I want to, I want to take you there once more, uh, just because oftentimes it relates to uh, looking at, at false religion or at other religions. People have this idea that uh, if you point out where someone is wrong, <laughs> that you hate them. Or if you point out where somebody is wrong, that that, that is uh, sort of like hate speech and you don't love them. Uh, can, I, can I challenge you to change the way you think about that this morning? Uh, the Bible says that open rebuke is better than secret love. Uh, you know, that's one of the hardest things about being a pastor is when you see something in one of your sheep's lives and you want to tell them and you don't want to offend somebody, but you know you love them. And so if you love them, you tell them the truth. Amen? Amen. And, and that's hard to do sometimes, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, look at Romans chapter 16 and uh, let's read verse number 17. This is now beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Can I, can I say this this morning? False religion does not show up, and, uh, and, and typically, in, in most cases, I mean there's an exception to this, but in most cases, false religion does not show up and just start killing a bunch of people. False religion does not show up and, and say, hey, I'm here to damn as many people to hell as I possibly can. False religion shows up in a nice package. False religion has a, an emphasis on the family. After all, I mean, what's, what's more important than, than taking care of your family, right? And uh, I'll tell you right now, a lot of churches, and uh, the one we're going to look at today is one of them, there's such a heavy emphasis on the family because... It, it, and guys, it's a biblical thing. Your family should be in order. I'm not going to take away from that. Uh, you should train your kids. Amen. Amen. I mean, you should love your wives, husbands, and, and why you should submit to your husbands. I mean, that's all biblical. Uh, but I can tell you this right now. There's a lot of, of false religion out there that puts an emphasis on the family, not because of a true desire to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and because they want rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. It's because it looks good. And man, if it looks good, more people will come. And if more people will come, we continue to build our kingdom in our church. And, uh, and listen, that's, that's not what this is about. Amen. Uh, and and let, me, let me say this. The Bible says, not me, you are, you are, you are told, you are commanded to, uh, to mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the documents you've learned and avoid them. Listen, if you know somebody that uh, 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 maybe, uh, you know, they're even a family member, but man, they're always coming around trying to get you to doubt the word of God. They hate the Bible. They hate your church. They hate what you stand for. Might not be a good idea to hang out with them all the time. <gasps> My own family? Yes, your own family. He that hateth not his father or his mother is not worthy of me. Right. Bible. <laughs> I didn't make that up. Jesus Christ said that. And that's a true disciple of Jesus Christ. I can tell you where a lot of people fall off is right there. I can preach about money and you're okay. I can preach about all kinds of things. People are okay. I met some families. <laughs> I've seen churches before where you have uh, several, uh, uh, you know, uh, families that are connected. I saw this in Tennessee, where a family uh, ended up bringing their cousins and their uncles and this and that. And before you know, there's three or four of those families in the church, and one of them got upset and they all left. Now, who were they there for? Watch out. Were they there for the Lord? I mean, the same people that said, oh, we love this church and the Bible is preached here. The next week they weren't there. Why? Because of family. Now, uh, I'm not preaching on family this morning. <laughs> I'm here to teach you about uh, defending the faith, but my point is this. Uh, family is not God. Okay? Okay. And just because people have their families together doesn't mean that they are necessarily on the right path doctrinally. Listen, you can apply biblical principles about your family, and lost people can have good families. Right. I, I'll tell you this. I've seen lost families that have more character than some Christian families do. Mm -hmm. i see some lost families where the kids are told what to do, and they say, yes, sir, they go do it. And some Christian families can't get their kids to do that. All right, so I'm not saying that someone can't apply biblical principles and have good fruit from it, but it doesn't mean that their doctrine is right. All right? So the Bible says we're supposed to mark them, and here's the question I'm going to put out to you this morning. How can you mark them if you don't know your own doctrine? He says to mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. And, and I want to challenge you this morning. You are, you are supposed to be a student of the Word of God. Uh, there's, this, there's this idea sometimes that uh, being a student of the Word of God means that you're a preacher or you're going to Bible school or you're some kind of great thing in the church. Hey, every single child of God is supposed to be a student of the Word of God. 
Uh, go over to uh, 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy. And uh, you should be very familiar with this verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and look at verse 15. And uh, uh, most every new Bible, I believe every single one with the exception of, I think, the New King James, uh, uh, changes the first word in this verse. Let me ask you something. There's only, let me put you out this way. There's only one place in your Bible where you are commanded to study the Bible. And it's right here. Well, who do you think would be behind changing that? <laughs> Not God. I can tell you that. Look what it says. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It amazes me at how, uh, you know, professionals in the workplace, and many of them are Christian. I, I've come across some Christians, professing Christians, and they'll go to engineering school, and they'll go to a, a lean manufacturing methodology training session, and they'll go to this, and they'll go to that. Why? To advance their career. And there's nothing wrong with that. But then when it comes to the Bible, well, that's for the preacher to study. No, 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 no. That's your responsibility. The Bible says you're supposed to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be seen. Let me park here for a while. The word approved is used for a reason, okay? And uh, think about this. Approved. Now, thank God that I am not trying to be approved for the saving of my soul. Amen? Jesus Christ took care of that for me. He put a stamp on my forehead. You can't see it, and I can't see yours, but it says approved right there, right? The day you accepted Christ, you were approved by God the Father because of Christ in you, right? right? But as it relates to your service, all right, let me give you another example. The Bible says in Galatians that we labor, whether present or absent, that we may be accepted of Him. And yet over in Romans chapter 8, it says you're already accepted in the Beloved. Well, one has to do with your sonship, the other one has to do with you being a servant, your servanthood. All right? Those are two different things. People get them confused all the time. But you are, you are told to study the Bible so you can be approved of God. Not so you can be approved by your pastor, by your family, by anybody else. But that God can say, listen, with the education you have and the resources you have, you know this book as best as you can. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you never went to Bible school. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, uh, how long you were in the world or wherever else. You've got time now. What are you doing with it? Are you studying the Bible? All right, it's important. The reason it's important is because, uh, unfortunately, you don't have, you know, uh, a pocket preacher. You can't pull up, you know, Pastor Adrian and go, okay, there's a Mormon at my door. What do I do? Now, if you called me, I'd be glad to help you. Maybe a little awkward for them to put me on speaker. That's fine. But, but eventually, at some point, you need to learn how to deal with this stuff on your own. Amen? Um, so, having said all that, let's talk about some things. And we said this before as well. And I know, guys, it's really small handwriting. I'll read some of this to you if you can't read it from where you're at. Uh, but we said this before. Things that are different are not the same. Amen. That relates to the Bible. That relates to the versions of the Bible. That relates to doctrine. That relates to uh, religion. Things that are different are not the same. All right? So... Uh, what I want to do is I want to look at some things, some positions that the Latter-day Saints Church takes. And when we say Latter-day Saints, it's the same thing as Mormon. They oftentimes refer to themselves as LDS. Uh, you ever seen people go on uh, vacation somewhere and they'll put a sticker on the back of the car and they'll say like, uh, you know, uh, EP for Estes Park. Or WP for Woodland Park or whatever else. You know, uh, CO for Colorado. They have those little, all right? Well, a lot of times you'll, you'll see on the back of their cars, they have a sticker, and those initials are there. That, that's Mormon is what that is, all right? Um, Latter-day Saints, LDS, Mormons, it's all the same thing. All right, but what, what position do they take on the Bible? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take their writings. I'm not going to take anything that I made up. I'm not going to take my opinion on where they come from. I'm going to take things that they have said and things that they have written, and I'm going to compare it to the Bible. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want you to understand it is not a denomination of Christianity. It is a cult. Okay? They're not a denomination of Christianity. They perceive them that they put that, that out there as they are, but they're not. Alright? So, let's look at the Bible. Guys, the Bible, and how you view the Bible as a foundation for your Christian life. If you approach the Bible, like a lot of Christians even do today, as, well, I, you know, this one's easier to understand. This one's a little bit better here, and I like this one, and I... It's not a matter of preference. There's a final authority, and it's that book right there. And your job is to get in line with it, not to get it in line with you. All right? So as it relates to the Bible, how do we pursue the Bible? What do they say about the Bible? Now, let me give you some things that they have said, okay? 
We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. All right, so what that means is uh, there are some places where it's not translated correctly. Now, this is from the Article of Faith number 8 from their own writings. All right? In other words, uh, listen, uh, you know, as, as, as long as it lines up with what we believe, and as long as it sounds like it was translated right, we'll go with it. In other words, there are some places where your Bible may not be translated correctly. Guys, I want to tell you right now, that's not just a Mormon thing. That's a modern-day Christian lie. And I say Christian because Christian lie doesn't really go together, does it? It's like Christian marijuana. It doesn't really fit, <laughs> right? All right? But uh, it, it's a modern-day uh, uh, lie that's out there. And I say it's modern-day. It was, goes back to the Garden of Eden. The, the devil questioned the Bible from the beginning. He questions God's Word. Listen, you believe, I, I pray that you do, and if you don't see me, I'd be more than glad to help you out with that. We did a whole series on why we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. Amen. And I did that for a reason. I don't want anyone to come to this church and go, well, you know, we're independent Baptists and we, you know, we, we, we use this Bible only. You know, that's not how this works. I don't just use that Bible because it's what the Christian colleges in my group say to do. I believe it. Amen. All right? And you have to have that same faith. All right? It is not a matter of whether it was translated correctly. I believe God took care of that supernaturally for us. Amen? Are you going to tell me that you believe God can take a dirty, wicked, rotten sinner full of sin, full of wickedness, and can mysteriously and miraculously wash away my sins by me calling on the name of a man who I never met, who claimed to be God in the flesh, and all that makes sense to you, but you can't believe that God can take the Bible and preserve it perfectly forever? I mean, that's a, that's a funny thing, isn't it? All right, the Bible says, we, uh, they say, we believe the Bible, the Word of God, as far as it is translated correctly. Now, let's compare that with the Scriptures, all right? Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And we'll look at a couple of uh, Scriptures this morning concerning uh, the infallibility, the inspiration, uh, the perfection of the Bible that you have. Matthew 24, and uh, look at verse 35. Matthew 24 and verse 35. Now I want to make a make a. I want you to underline uh, the word words in this verse. All right. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Uh, back around the late 1800s, early 1900s, there became there came uh, this uh, new brand of Christianity, if you will, called neo orthodoxy. All right. And what they do with the Bible is they say, well, we believe in the overall message of the Bible. It's not the words themselves that are that important, but the overall message. And as long as, now this is how this translates today. Talk to a modern day Christian, you say, hey, there's only one Bible. How can you say that? I mean, the gospel's not changed from this Bible. Well, no, it's not. But the words are. Right? Alright, so it's not the overall message that we're concerned. Listen, that we know that has to be right. But we want to drill down to the next layer and look at the words that convey the message. Alright? Uh, Matthew 24, 35 says, My words shall not pass away. Look at the Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. Now you may think that, uh, well, that's just a hobby, for, a hobby horse or whatever else. Let me explain something to you. It's not a hobby horse. It is foundational to Christian living. Uh, I grew up in a church that uh, preached this book and believed this book. And uh, today, they're, uh, they're contemporary messes, what they are. And I have no problem saying that. If you go by the church, it'll say the name of the church in, in real, real small letters, a Baptist faith community. And it, in other words, it gives you this name like they're a non-denominational church. You know why? Because that's the way they go. Mm -hmm. They kick that Bible out. They say it's old-fashioned. Come as you are. They got the whole contemporary band thing going. And you know, it is a shadow. It is a shell of what it used to be. All right? Uh, that's, why, that's why I harp on that. Too, though, in a lot of the new Bibles, they take, like, the word blood out of the gospel message, even though people don't, if they really study their actual Bible, and then they, even eternal security, I've heard, is kind of... Messed with. Yeah. The blood is a very important thing, because the blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses our sins. It's what allows for the uh, redemption of our souls. And that's very important. The Bible says in Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood... Even the forgiveness of sins, most modern Bibles take out through His blood. They say, "Who we have redemption? Even the forgiveness of sins." Now, guys, redemption and forgiveness aren't the same thing. Redemption came through His blood. 
brother, is there a problem? And I say, so, oh, okay. <laughs> Sunday school teacher needs his Bible. <laughs> Preaching on the Bible is for how much you need it. This is best man's Bible. <laughs> Psalm chapter 12, look at verse 6 and look at verse 7. Look at this. Underline it. Words. Not the message or the principle or the idea or the word of God. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, I didn't have this verse in the board, but turn over to the book of Proverbs. And uh, we were reading the Proverbs for the day on the way to church this morning. Now, I wasn't reading, I was driving. <laughs> but, uh, my family sure. was reading. And I was listening, and there was a verse that came up, and uh, I, I thought it was very, very interesting. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see, it was the one about silver. Remember that? Yes. Please. Look at the verse 20. The tongue of the just is as choice, what? Silver. The tongue of the just is as choice silver. Isn't that interesting? You know what that tells me? Now, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen? Amen. So what that verse tells me is that the word of God is likened to silver being purified, Psalm 12, 6, and 7. And I'm speaking the things that are right. I'll be speaking the words of God. Amen? The tongue of the justice has choice silver. In other words, input equals output. Right? But, but back to Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Uh, the Bible says this. And I want you to notice this in verse 6. Psalm 12 and verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth. You know what that tells me? God, listen, people use the word, the, the verse, and it's in Matthew. Uh, uh. My, uh, over in Psalms, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And I had a, a, a fundamentalist preacher tell me one time, see, you can't have a perfect Bible because it was settled in heaven. I said, sir, with all due respect, I understand that it was settled in heaven, but God purified it on the earth for us to have. It does no good to mankind if it's not down here. Amen? Right. All right? So it's purified seven times in a furnace of fire. Uh, here in a furnace of, uh, of the earth, purified seven times. And God says in verse 7, or David's writing to the Lord, speaking to the Lord, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Now what is the then in verse 7? The words from verse 6, right? So we're on the same page. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them until the originals passed away. <laughs> until the last, you know, writer in the book of Revelation put out that manuscript, and after that we could know. From this generation for how long? Forever. And it's important that you understand that. All right? We don't believe that God... We, listen, guys, it's like this. The, the way I look at the Bible and, and, and the fact that we have the preserved Word of God, I look at it just like the, you, the saving of your soul. Imagine, this is how some churches present it, because of a lack of understanding of the Scriptures. Imagine God says, okay, I'm going to give you this free gift, I'm going to give you eternal life, and I'm going to wash away your sins. But now, if you mess up, dear God, you're, you're going down again. You're going to hell. Imagine God saying, hey, I'm going to give my words perfectly... But after that first generation of people that write it, no one else is going to have it. What good does that do to us? <laughs> it's madness. But that's how a lot of people look at it. Now listen, we don't. Uh, look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Now as you turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, I want you to look at these verses. Even if you're familiar with them, look at them again. Get familiar with them. Because you need to know where to find these verses uh, when somebody starts talking this way about the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 20. And as you turn there, uh, Jesus Christ tells his disciples, uh, or when he prays to the Father, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. The way he cleans us is through the word of God. How do you clean something if the object you're using is dirty? <laughs> Doesn't work. Second Peter chapter 1, look at verse 20. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Amen. For the prophecy came on the whole time by the will of man. Now, this is the way some people present this. All right, God inspired the Bible, but the men that were involved translating it messed up. Now, look what he says. All right, the prophecy came on the whole time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God was involved in the inspiration process, and God was also involved in the preservation process. All right, uh, look at... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's look at verse 16. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and verse 16. Now, I'm going to read this to you. And I'm going to present to you the idea that's put out by a lot of, a lot of 
you know, churches uh, today that, that preach the right gospel and all that, but uh, they're still a little bit off. Look at verse 16. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God. Do you understand what inspiration is? God uh, takes man and he, he puts, pulls man together from the dust of the ground. By the way, if you start thinking highly of yourself, just remember you're a dirt ball. Right. That's how God made you. All right? He, he takes man and he puts him together. The Bible says he formed him out of the dust of the ground. And then he breathed into his nostrils the what? The breath of life. That is literally, that's inspiration. That is to put spirit or breath or wind into something. Inspiration is putting spirit in something. And so we say that the, the, the Bible is inspired. What we're saying is or it was given by inspiration of God is that God gave the words of God and he only had to do to make... Listen, guys, if this was just like any of the book, you know what you'd be missing? You'd be missing this. You know what God has to do to give life to something? He's got to breathe his spirit into it. Right. You realize before you got saved, you had a dead spirit? Yeah. Right? Ephesians chapter 2. And then God gives you the Holy Spirit. You understand that before God does that with any, with any scriptures, it's just a book. It's just a writing. But man, God breathed on that thing. And uh, we don't believe that God breathed on it. And then a generation passes and that inspiration is lost. Right? We believe that inspiration is preserved uh, through God's miraculous hand and preservation. But, but look at this. Look at this in verse 16. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, first thing there, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, let me give you the way that most people read this. Uh, all originals were given by inspiration. All originals were inspired. But, since that time, you've lost inspiration because you went from one language to another. That's the way it's presented. Here's the problem with that. Look at verse 15. And that from a child, thou hast known the holy what? What does verse 16 say? All scriptures give my inspiration. Now let me ask you a question. Let's think for a second. Let's put our thinking cap on. And uh, Paul's writing to Timothy. All right? So they, this is probably 40, 50 AD, something like that. Uh, he's writing to Timothy, maybe even closer to 60 AD. I forget. It's somewhere in that time frame. He's writing to Timothy about how when Timothy was a child, he had the Holy Scriptures. And in verse 16, you read that all scriptures give my inspiration to God. Let me ask you a question. Timothy is in 40, 50, 60 A.D. Those Old Testament originals were given, what, 1500, 2000 B.C.? Do you think he had the originals, guys? Were they inspired? Oh, yeah. So this idea that somehow, because it's not the originals, you no longer have inspired scriptures, that is not Bible. And if you compare scripture with scripture, you'll see that. All right, so let, let's move on. Let's go on to this. Uh, the, the LDS Church, one of the other things that they believe about the Bible is that the Bible you have, the King James Bible, was not all the scriptures that God wanted you to have. In other words, there's going to be uh, 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 more added to the Word of God after Revelation chapter 22. Are you okay with that? I'm not okay with that. All right? They, uh, this is something that, uh, uh, I forget which there, I'll look at it in a second. One of the leaders says, Woe be unto him that shall say... We have received the word of God, and we need no more, for we have enough. The context was arguing with people who say, hey, this is the Bible you guys added to it. And he's saying, hey, woe to you if you believe this is enough, because it's not. There's more that God wanted you to know. All right? Uh, look at Revelation 22. Revelation 22. The last book in the Bible. Revelation 22, look at verse uh, 18. Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 18. Revelation 22 and verse 18. By the way, that quote that I quoted to you is, in, is from the Book of Mormon, uh, from 2 Nephi chapter 28 and verse 29. Uh, <laughs> Revelation 22, look at verse 18. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away as part of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now there's a lot, a lot of doctrinal things that we could jump, to, jump into in verses 18 and verse 19. For sake of time, that's not the point. The point is this. Can we just leave it at this? God does not care for people adding to his words. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we leave it there for now? 
In, in Deuteronomy, the same kind of warnings are given. When God gives the law, he tells them not to add to it. Uh, Eve got in trouble in the Garden of Eden. You know why? Because she added to the Word of God. All right? Remember how she, uh, and I think I don't know, if, honey, if, if, if a wife's going through some lazy Bible study, but uh, Eve is there, and she talks about how uh, when she's, you know, talking to the serpent, and uh, that was the first mistake. Amen? Don't even give that opportunity. But she's talking to the serpent, and as she's talking to him, she says, you know, God says that uh, we can't uh, uh, eat of this fruit, neither can we touch it, lest we die. God never said about touching it. Right. All right? Uh, she added that. And you start adding the word of God, you get in trouble. Now listen, the reason they believe that your Bible is not enough is because, get this, it's almost like marketing, right? A marketeer will tell you, you need more. You deserve more. You don't have everything you need. Why? Because he wants you to buy the goods. He wants you to buy what he has for sale. And so if I want you to read something outside of that right there, I'm going to tell you, hey, listen, that is not enough. You need something else. And I've got it right here. <laughs> All right? And so that's the issue here. Understand that your Bible is complete. It does not need to be added to. It does not need to be taken away from. Uh, I, I heard a preacher say it this way one time. The Bible does not need to be rewritten. It needs to be reread. Amen. <laughs> so uh, that's on the Bible. Let's talk about God's nature. Some ways that we look at things a little differently. Uh, one of the things they talk about is omnipresence. That means God is everywhere at once. This is uh, from one of their uh, leaders. False creeds teach that God is a spirit essence that fills the immensity of space and is everywhere. All right? Uh, no, sir. False creeds don't teach that. God said that about himself. Uh, look at John chapter 4. Jesus Christ says that about himself. John chapter 4. John chapter 4 this morning. And uh, Jesus is talking to a woman at the well. And you know he tells that woman at the well because uh, she's talking about where they worship and how important that is. And he says, lady, you got it all wrong. It's not so much where you worship it. It's not just about where you worship. It's about who you're worshiping. Amen? And how you're worshiping. Now look at John 4, look at verse 24. God is a what? Spirit. spirit. And they that worship him is worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, if, if this doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. Look at John chapter... Oh, let's see here. Did I do it again? I think I did. Uh, let's see. John chapter 3 and verse number 13. I don't know why I always put verse 14 and that's always wrong. And I always do it. All right. John 3 and verse 13. All right. John 3 and verse 13. If this doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will, but I'll tell you this much. It definitely proves that God can be everywhere at once. Uh, John 3 and verse 13. It also shows you that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, he's talking about himself, even the Son of Man, wait for it, which is in heaven. Wait a minute, I think you I thought you were right here. I am. But you just said you're up there. I am. Why? Because I am. Amen. He <laughs> is the I am. Alright? John 3.13. That's something we see. Look at, uh, for a second time, don't look there. Uh, but uh, Proverbs 15.3 says the eyes, I used to, I used to preach this verse a lot. When we go down to... Uh, Certain places in Pensacola, and uh, preach where there's a lot of young guys who want to have a good time. I'd say, hey, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. I'll never forget one time I had a young man who was saved, and he uh, was in the Navy, and he was backslidden, and his family was praying for him, and he came over to argue with us. He went inside the bar, and came back out and started crying and said, you're right. I don't know if that guy ever came to church, but for people to say that preaching on the street doesn't work, man, think again. Uh, it can if it's done the right way. I'll say it that way. All right? But that verse is a good verse. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Well, we look good. All right? The omnipresence of God. God is everywhere. All right? Because here's the problem with, with, with what we're looking at in this religion. You're going to see this. They want to be God. They want God to be man. I remember back in the 90s. What if God was what of us? Just a slob like one of us. Those words are going to come back really harshly at the great white throne judgment if that person is going to say. I don't say that rejoicing. I'm just being honest. It's the right. truth. And God is not like one of us. God is not a man that he should lie. nor the son of man that he should repent. All right? How about holiness? Uh, uh, the holiness of God. <laughs> man, God is so holy. And if you can just sometimes, when you get down to prayer, I don't know about you. You know what I try to do? I try to get down and I, I close my eyes, not just because it's what we do, but 
is to block out all the things that are going on around you. And I try to imagine being in the third heaven, sitting at the throne of God, sitting, just, just, uh, lying down before him, as we'll be in heaven someday, as the Bible says, casting our crowns at his feet. And I imagine that throne with a, with a, a, a rainbow like and unto an emerald round about the throne. And I imagine the Bible says that there'll be no need for the sun, because he is the light of that city, and the glory that comes off that throne. And yet there is, that's holiness. You know what the angelic beings cry for eternity? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God is holy. He's not like us. He's perfect. He's pure. All right, now, let me give you, let me give you something to, to think about. In the Pearl of Great Price, I didn't write out the whole story. I don't have room for it. You already have room to get this on there. In the Pearl of Great Price, which is another one of their books, in, in the book of Abraham, chapter 2, verses 22 through 25, it tells a story that you might find familiar, except for some things are changed. Remember how Abraham goes down into Egypt uh, and he lies about uh, Sarah being his wife? He says, she's my sister, right? And, uh, sisters. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he says, he says to, the, to, the, to the king, he says, hey, this is my wife, or my, my sister. And then the king sees him sort of, you know, flirting. He says, you know, he's sporting with his wife. Hey, by the way, if you're married, you should be sporting with your wife. You've been flirting a little bit. It's not, it shouldn't stop when you put the ring on the finger. <laughs> right? But, uh, but anyways, uh, in the Bible story, Abraham lies. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you in the Bible story, does God tell Abraham to lie? No. Now, let me read this to you out of the Pearl of Great Price. And... Uh, this is how it reads in, in the Pearl of Great Price. The Lord said unto me, Behold, Sarai, thy wife is a very fair woman to look upon. Therefore she come back, when the Egyptians shall see her, they will say, She is thy wife. And they will kill you, but they will save her alive. Therefore, see that ye do on this wise. Now guys, if you read the Bible, Abraham's thinking this thing through himself. God's not telling Abraham this. He's thinking this. And it's a great picture of how sometimes when we get in trouble, instead of just saying, God, what, what, what is the right thing to do? We do what comes natural, and we lie. All right, and oftentimes you pay for it. But in this story, the Pearl of Great Price, God is telling Abraham, Hey, Abraham, here's what you need to do. All right? Let her say unto the Egyptians, She is thy sister, and thy soul shall live. And it came, you know what this thing tells you? That God tells a man to lie. Well, listen, that's not my God. All right? That is a rewritten account of a biblical story <laughs> twisted. All right? Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 57, and then look at Hebrews chapter 6. Isaiah 57, and then Hebrews 6. Isaiah 57, let's look at verse number 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one, notice the word one is capitalized, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Look at that, capitalized. His name is holy. He's not just holy as an adjective, that is his name. Uh, Holy Father. By the way, that title should only be given to God. That's who He is. All right. I dwell in the high and holy place with Him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble soul and so forth. Right? He says that He's the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. All right. Look at Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six. I quoted the verse to you earlier. Uh, it's an Old Testament verse, but it's a New Testament principle as well. And it says that God is not a man that He should lie, nor the Son of man that He should repent. God doesn't need to lie. And God wouldn't lie. <laughs> because He is truth. Alright? Now think about Pilate saying what is truth. And Jesus Christ is saying right in front of him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Imagine someone that claims to be the truth telling another person to lie. There's something wrong with that. Look at Hebrews 6 and look at verse number 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Now listen, guys, you know, people all the time say, well, can God make a rock so heavy you can't lift, you know, or something so like that. I'll tell you one thing God won't do, and God can't do, He will not break His Word. God binds Himself by His Word because He's perfect and He's holy. We have a hard time with that because His people will tell someone we'll be there at 10 o'clock, and if they're at 10, 15, we think nothing of it. All right, now, I'm not talking about Sunday school. I, that was just a weird random time I picked. I really, <laughs> seriously, I just point that out. My wife has really been, you know, helping me with the fact that I... Man, you know, let's spend culture. We just guess it, I said, uh, whatever will be, will be. You know, get there at 10, 15, 10, 20, it's okay. 
And you know what? I murdered a white person, and she's helping me out with my schedule. <laughs> Remember when we went to Bolivia? We got there, and, and I, you know, <laughs> I asked him, what time the services start? I'm the pastor, and I don't know what time services start. Because I took a church after being there for a week, which was crazy. And I took this church, and, and I said, what time services start? Six o'clock tonight, pastor? Okay. I get there at 6 o'clock. Nobody else is there but me and my family. At about 6.15, everybody starts pouring in. 6.20, the music starts. 6.30, we actually start service. And I asked him, I said, is it always this way? I think, oh, yeah, you'll get used to it. You know? <laughs> I, I, I think that I never really quite got used to that. But uh, here's the thing. We, we lie to you all the time. Someone asks you, how you doing? Doing great, you liar. I'm doing great. I'm a bad day. I'm an awful attitude. You know what I say? Not so well, but it's my fault. By the grace of God, it'll be a better day. Amen. That's the truth, right? All right, we do that all the time, but God doesn't do it. Uh, all right, it was impossible for God to lie. All right, we like the holiness of God. I'm going to end with this. We'll close with this. All right, the mercy and loving kindness of God. Aren't you glad that God is merciful? Amen. Aren't you glad that God uh, puts up with you? <laughs> uh, aren't you glad that salvation, God did not make it so hard and so difficult that... Uh, that you didn't have a chance. Let me let me read this to you, okay? This is from uh, a writer from Joseph Fielding Smith, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1, page 135. Joseph Smith taught that there were certain sins so grievous that man may commit, that they will place the transgressors beyond the power of the atonement of Christ. If these offenses are committed, I'm guessing they never committed them, but somebody else probably would. It's funny, we talk to people that, that think they can lose their salvation. I was asking, you ever lost it? No. But someone else has? Probably. Oh, okay. All right, just checking. If these offenses are committed, then the blood of Christ will not cleanse them from their sins, even though they repent. Therefore, their only hope is to have their own blood shed to atone, as far as possible in their behalf. And you go, oh man, you're being mean. Guys, that's far out there. Someone, you know what that is? That's paganism. When I commit a transgression against the God of the trees or the God of this, you know, I've got to atone for it somehow and I've got to slip my wrist or something. Remember where the, the, the prophets of Baal were there against Elijah? You know what they started doing? They were cutting their wrists and, Oh, Baal, hear us! Oh, Baal, hear us! The Bible says until the blood gushed out. I mean, just a mess. Why? A man trying to atone for his own sins, he can't do it. That's the central theme of the gospel, guys. Is as good as you can be, you cannot pay for your sins because you and I are not perfect beings. Right. I'm glad that the Bible says, but God who is rich in his mercy for his great love were with him of this. Aren't you glad for that? Yeah. I'm glad for Hebrews 9 12, for by his own blood, not mine, not yours, by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Guys, uh, again, like I said earlier, what we're looking at is not uh, to show that uh, these people are bad people. It's to understand what pure and right doctrine is and how to avoid those that are against it and how to stand up for what you believe and how to maybe take somebody who was a, uh, I'll put you this way, my dad was Catholic growing up, but you know what he was? He was a nominal Catholic. He was born Catholic, sprinkled Catholic, uh, first communion Catholic, raised Catholic, but man, when he grew up, he realized, eh, I don't want to go to church. And I'm glad somebody took him aside and said, hey, let's go what the Bible says. I mean, what, what if we could do that with someone who believes in this? Good people, they love their families, they want to do right, but they've been deceived. And you can't do it if you don't know where they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah? So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. And I hope that's a blessing to you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the clarity that it provides. And God, I pray you uh, help us to study the word of God. Help us to be prepared as we encounter people and the different backgrounds that they come from. Father, I pray you bless uh, the morning service. Be with those that are on their way and will help us have the right spirit. In Jesus' name.